Good morning, and welcome to the virtual worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other in our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I am so glad that you have joined us this week. Today, our worship service is about getting back in touch with what we are feeling in each moment. Maybe you have some spiritual practices that help you to stay present and grounded. This week is certainly a week when you will need to be drawing on those practices. For today, I simply invite you to slow down a little Take some deep breaths with me. And enter with me into this sacred space, which this morning is created out of many spaces. As I light our chalice here at the meeting house, I invite you to light a candle wherever you are. In that way, we can feel connected even while we are apart. The Persistent Flame by Amy Brooks. Even as the days grow shorter and our homes shrink smaller and our wicks burn lower and our will to endure flickers, we light this chalice to kindle a flame of warmth as a reminder of the connection that draws us in to a community that opens us up. In gratitude, for the breath in our lungs and the love in our hearts, for the gift of this day alive. Please join me in affirming our meeting house covenant. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. It is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another.
Our reading this morning is by Gwen Matthews. Feel that each breath, every inhale, exhale. We are living, breathing, connected. We are the whole, complete, beautiful selves that we were born to be. Feel that in your bones, in your muscles, in your heart and your blood. That is the extraordinary you. The you who was born for this time, this place, this moment. Feel that, the struggle, the worry, the pain, the loss, the grief, it is still you. You are still whole, beautiful, extraordinary. Feel that. I sat with a grieving friend the other day and asked how she was managing it all. I like to keep the kitchen sink clear, she said. When I see a coffee cup and a spoon in there, it, it, it bothers me. So I go and I wash them. That feels good. My friend's husband died a little less than two months ago and her whole world has been upended, and the wisdom of her grief astounds me. How are you managing it all? I keep the kitchen sink clear. I thought of her this morning as I washed a mug and felt the hot, soapy water on my hands. 
When it was clean, I placed it upside down on the drawing board and looked at the empty sink with a sense of great accomplishment. And then I just stood there for a moment. On our own levels, we are each grieving, I think. Some of our lives have been completely upended, some merely inconvenienced. Some of our losses have been personal, some global. Some of them we will get over, and some of them we never will. Other emotions mix in with the grief. Anxiety, compassion, hope, rage. Sometimes the swirl of emotions makes the air feel thick, like pea soup. Like I am wading through something that I cannot see, but which slows me down. I accomplish less in a day, I notice. It's becoming harder to decide what to do next, but it felt good to wash the mug, to clear the sink. Poet David White writes, start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way of starting the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To find another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes a private ear listening to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in. The step you don't want to take. Feel that, Gwen Matthews asks. And I'm not sure that we do. Just like with grief that can be stuffed or delayed or swallowed, sometimes our other feelings defy naming. They lump themselves together unidentified and take on a new identity as overwhelm or blue or fog or lump in the throat halfway down. Perhaps when we start close in, we can start by naming our emotions, separating them out from one another. Over the summer, my chimes that hang in the tree outside my porch became caught up in the wind and fell to the ground. I found them there, a tangled mess, strings crossing and nodding everywhere. I laid the chimes out on a table and began unwinding them slowly. I crossed and uncrossed the threads in a sort of reverse braiding motion. At first, it was like untying knots, but then, as it loosened, it was like following a well-worn path downhill. Each step became easier and more clear until suddenly each string was free and untethered, spacious. I held up the chimes 
and heard the familiar sound as the strands and metal pieces gently met each other in conversation. It felt so good, this slow and intentional task. It was like washing the mug, clearing the sink. Mary Oliver says, this is the first, the wildest, and the wisest thing I know, that the soul exists and is built entirely out of attentiveness. This is the first, the wildest, and wisest thing I know, that the soul exists and is built entirely out of attentiveness. On my way home from a rally the other day in which I was forced to listen to hateful messages through a bullhorn for two hours, I found myself driving aggressively, which is not my usual MO. I felt like I was just waiting for someone to cut me off so that I could lean on my horn. Feel that? I didn't think to ask myself. Feel that? What is that? If I had asked myself that, I might have been able to name anger. Not the productive, clarifying rage that sets a person in motion, but the kind that makes your face hot and your mind go blank. The kind that makes you want to lean on your horn at a stranger. If I had asked myself that, I might have been able to name disappointment. A deep sense of feeling let down by humanity or the lack of humanity that allows us to bellow at each other through bullhorns, not really seeing or hearing each other at all. If I had asked myself that, I might have been able to name sadness. Sadness at deaths that could have been prevented. Sadness at not being able to hug people I haven't seen in a long time. Sadness at not being able to sing the songs that make me feel better. Because I didn't name my feelings, I remained weighted down for the next few days by the fog, the blues, the lump in the throat halfway down. Our interactions with the outside world, with those that have experienced the last eight months differently than we have, with those who have very different visions of what they want the world to be, our interactions have become a tangled knot and none of us seems to have the patience to untangle them. We don't seem to have it in us to be attentive to one another. So we stay that way, stuck, unmusical. Lisa told me the other night about an organization called Braver Angels that is seeking to heal some of the political divide in this country. The founders are distraught at the polarization and dehumanization so embedded in our politics these days. They want to give people and communities the tools they need to talk with one another, to heal some of the wounds caused by such divisiveness. Listening to her explain their mission, I wasn't sure what to think. I wasn't sure about their name, for one. Leaving aside the word angels, which is fraught in and of itself, I needed to figure out what I thought about the word 
braver in this context. Part of me thinks that the braver thing to do is to be more committed than ever to your own values and beliefs, to fight hard for them and defend them and the people you love. That feels brave to me. And conversation is also brave. I see that. Being willing to listen is brave, but can also be harmful when what is being said is hateful or untrue. It can feel like gaslighting. Do I need to sign up for that? Debate is for things like which flavor of ice cream is better, not which humans should have rights. Hmm. Braver angels. I do think I could learn something from their workshops. Although I'll be honest, I'm probably not going to sign up for any of them. But there's a skill there that I'm wanting. I am wanting to be able to have conversations across difference, across disappointment, across anger, across gray areas, across victories and defeats. I'd like to go back to that space where we can have conversations, not because I think I can convince anybody that I am right and they are wrong, and not because I think I will change my own mind, but because I want to be able to remember clearly why I believe the things I do, what I am grieving, and why they were so important to me, are so important to me. I want to go back to that space where we can have conversations because I didn't like how it felt in the car when my anger rose to my face, hot and blinding, reactive and inarticulate. I didn't like how it felt for days afterwards, slogging through the thick fog of unnamed feelings. I didn't like not feeling like me. If I can get back to that space where each strand of the chimes has the room to make its own sound, where I can articulate clearly the things that are important to me and why, then I'm pretty sure that I'll also be able to listen. I'm pretty sure that I'll also be able to see the humanity before me disguised as it sometimes is with certainty and vitriol. And when I can get back to that space, I will feel more like myself. Feel that, the struggle, the worry, the pain, the loss, the grief, it is still you. You are still whole, complete, beautiful, extraordinary. Feel that. Feel that. Amen and blessed be.